thank you all for coming out. It's always, uh, you know, I get, I'm so lucky, you know, beyond working with plants, working with great people, you know, staff, volunteers, everybody, I get to go away on trips and then people will come and listen to me talk about what I did on my winter vacation. Um, you know, usually you had to, you have to, you know, corral people into the house with, with show them a slideshow. I guess that's the old way. Now you just put it all on Facebook, right? Everybody goes. So before I get into it, I do want to talk about, mention one thing. Chris uh, talked about a bunch of programs, but a great one that's coming up, a uh, joint program between the Arboretum and Juniper Level Botanic Garden is the Southeastern Plant Symposium. We've got uh, 16 speakers, uh, two days. This is going to be just fantastic speakers. John Grimshaw, some of you may have heard here before um, from the, the Yorkshire Arboretum. He wrote the fantastic uh, reference book, New Trees, Recent Introductions to Cultivation. He's working on a shrub one, I believe, right now. Really just amazing person. He's got, you know, Tony Avon's going to be talking, Scott McMahon from Atlanta Botanic Garden, Ted Stevens from Nurseries Carolina. Oh, we got we got so many people. I can't I can't keep track of all of them. There's there's a bunch of them though. So um, come on down. Uh, look look online. You can register for this. It's really going to be a great thing. June seventh and eighth. And if the speakers weren't enough, we got some great auction plants. Um, we're going to be doing a one of our meliodendron uh, Suzuki Pink. Uh, this is a that that flower on this. It's like a Styrax with almost a four inch flower on it. It is amazing and it's this nice clear pink and we have not distributed at all yet so we should have one for the, the auction things like magnolia wilsonii which are tough to come by a really great red unnamed red uh incianthus sicocianus new growth comes out burgundy uh the flowers are really nice deep red we've got some cool stuff for this auction um, and that's just kind of scratching the tip uh, so, so really, um, if you love plants, this is going to be a great time to, to come and visit. I was looking at our registration list, and you know, there's about a third of our registration list that Tony and I had probably would have considered to be speakers at the event um, who are coming to attend because they're so excited about it. Uh, the vice president for horticulture at Atlanta Botanic Garden is coming up to it. It's it's going to be a really good event. So, where will it be held, Mark? It's going to be held at the. Um, I always hate to say this because there's two of them. It's the Embassy Suites at the Research Park, but it's not actually at the Research Park. It's in Cary. Um, is that right? Chris? Right off of four, or 40. Right off of 40. Across from SAS. There you go. Across from SAS. Um, it's it's, it's going to be a really um, fantastic two-day event. All right. New Zealand. New Zealand is a long way away <laughs> from Raleigh. That's first off. I'm pretty used to being in airplanes, but that is even a long flight for me. It's it's something like, you know, I don't know, 20 hours, something like that. It's a long way. It's 8,500 miles if you go straight uh, there, and you know you don't go straight in a plane. <coughs> Um, most people, when you ask them about New Zealand, will say, oh, yeah, they, they know New Zealand. It's the thing that's right by Australia, right off the coast of Australia. In fact, somebody who was going on the trip, I won't mention who, uh, asked me if there was going to be any time if they could do, like, a ferry over to Australia. <laughs> and I said, no, it's not that close. It's closer than 8,500 miles, but it's about, Sydney is about as far from Auckland as uh, we are from Colorado here in Raleigh, so that would be a long ferry ride. <laughs> Might not make it back for dinner. Um, <laughs> New Zealand's a, a, you know, it's an interesting place. It's, it's about land mass wise, the si size of the United Kingdom. Um, they're very, it's, there's a few islands, but mostly it's two islands. There's one to the north called the North Island, and one to the south called the South Island. Yeah, very imaginative. Um, very imaginative there. Uh, it's got a population of about four and a half million people. So to put that in perspective, North Carolina has a population of uh, almost 11 million. So you've got more than twice as many uh, people here. And in Auckland, which is up here, which is where most people fly in and out, most of the international flights are there. Auckland has more people in it than the entire site, South Island. 
So uh, that just kind of gives you a perspective on, on where everything is. And you got to remember that this is backwards. The farther north you go, the warmer it is. The farther south you go, the, the cooler it is. Um, there are, yeah, so four and a half million people. There's about 30 million sheep there. <laughs> uh, but the ratio of sheep is going down compared to dairy cattle, which is actually a problem. Uh, New Zealand is one of, if not the biggest exporter of dairy products. Uh, and cow are really hard on the landscape. Uh, sheep are pretty easy. Cow are tough. And it's going to be a, it's going to be a real problem down the road as, as the number of cows uh, grows. But, so all of Pizza Hut's mozzarella cheese for all of their pizzas comes from New Zealand. Every bit of it. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of meatballs. Um, it's, uh, so, where was I going with that? I don't know. Um, the capital is, is down here, it's Wellington, um, Windy Wellington, it's, it's a real breezy place. Uh, but it's, it's a kind of an interesting island, it runs, it's very volcanic, so you got this rim of uh, volcanoes running down the middle. Here's some, some, some quick facts for you about, about New Zealand. Uh, it is the first place uh, that bungee jumping was done commercially. It had been done other places, but um, you know, it was patterned after the, the people who tie the vines to their legs in Vanuatu and jump off to show their manhood. They did bungee jumping for the first time there. Um, there's a lot of sheep there. People get bored. <laughs> there is, and now this is, for all you native North Carolinians, this, is, this may be tough for y'all to swallow, but there is actually good eyewitness reports that somebody flew a plane for about a half a mile about three or four months before the Wright brothers did here in North Carolina. So, wise may not be wise first in flight. It's all wise tale, huh? <laughs> well, I'm not say I'm saying there's some, some eyewitnesses. I don't know if they're, they're uh, reliable ones, but there is a possibility. They're not alive either. Exactly. That's right. No, no, they're not alive. <laughs> So another thing about it, no matter where you are in New Zealand, you are never more than 80 miles from the ocean. You cannot get more than 80 miles away from the ocean. So if you, right there, you're, you're you know, right there, you are within 80 miles. Now you got to drive down little winding roads a lot of times, so you may be a couple hours away, but um, you're still that, that close. Uh, another claim to fame for New Zealand, besides being the first place to, to commercialize bungee jumping, they were the first place to have universal uh, suffrage. So they gave women the right to vote um, about 30 or so years before uh, it happened in the U.S. So um, in the 1890s. Uh, what else do we have? Now to go along with that, I knew there was something else. On their $10 note, they have Kate Shepard, who was kind of the most prominent uh, suffragette of the time, is on their $10 note. I thought that was interesting. Um, and so it's a, it's a great place to go. It's known, if people go there for, tourism is, is really one of its major um, commercial enterprises. And people come to go hiking, to do extreme sports, to do all kinds of stuff. And, and there's a lot of great hiking because so much of it, about a third of the total landmass is um, is National Protected Park. Of course, like. A lot of that is this whole area down here is basically part. The Southland is is all um, uh, national park. So uh, got this pushed up ridge because it is part of the the Ring of Fire around the um, the oh we'll, we'll get here it's it, well, part of the Ring of Fire. So New Zealand uh, they back in the 70s you know the the native Maori people were not treated very well uh, like a lot of other places that Europeans settled. Um, but New Zealand has really tried to, to, have, to, to bring the Maori culture back, to, to really put it on an equal footing. So almost everywhere you go, you'll see an English name and a Maori name uh, for, for everything. And they, New Zealand has three official languages. They have uh, English, New, uh, Maori, and then New Zealand Sign Language. They're the first, maybe the only country to have a sign language as one of their official languages. Um, but, but in Maori, uh, the, the name of New Zealand is Eotearoa. I don't, don't, don't hold me to any pronunciations. Land of the Long White Cloud. They also have the longest place name anywhere in the world. I will not, 
try to pronounce this um, because I can't. It's much easier in English where it translates to the place where Tamatia, the man with the big knees who slid, climbed, and swallowed mountains, known as the land eater, played his nose flute to his loved ones. <laughs> Is that true? I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, it seems like a lot there to, to write. You can say Maori was not a written language for much of its history. I guess it flows off the tongue a little bit easier than it would be having to write that down on an envelope. So, you know, like I said, part of the Ring of Fire. So there is a lot of volcanic activity, you know, hot springs. Uh, mud, you know, hot mud areas, uh, active volcanoes, uh, that sort of thing. Big divers. I need to do every 45 minutes. This is in a Maori, it's a tourist area, but it's also a, an actual Maori village. People live there and uh, use the springs for cooking and that sort of thing as well. Boiling the water. It's kind of neat. Use the springs for what? Like, like cooking, for bathing, for doing all kinds of stuff, for heating houses. Now, I'm not going to, this is not really a plant talk, but, but there are some, some odd things with the plants there. They have some, some groups that are interesting. They have a lot of woody asters. Um, you see this a little something through, through the southern hemisphere, but uh, things like Oliria that are these beautiful shrubs. And most of the plants in New Zealand, most of them are evergreen. Not all of them, but most of them are evergreen. And another oddity, they have very few annual herbaceous plants. You know, we have all these little annual weeds and, and pretty flowers and things. They don't really have much of that at all. Most everything is, is perennial there. Um, but, so, but some really cool stuff, these, these you know, aster flower things, and things like pachystesias and brachyglottis, these lovely evergreen um, shrubby plants. And they become trees, and they become big, uh, big plants. The other thing is ferns. They have a tremendous diversity of ferns. Uh, they have about 10 tree fern species, and in fact, the, one of the symbols of kind of the two things that, that the <coughs> New Zealanders, Kiwis, you know, used to kind of identify themselves, their islands are, uh, the, the shape of a, of a palm frond, uh, fiddlehead unfurling, the, the kuru, uh, and then the silver fern, which is the symbol there their rugby team, you know, the back side is very sil uh, silver. Um, really gorgeous ferns though. This is, this has now become my holy grail plant. Tony, if you can find me Maradia or Tisena salicina, <laughs> I desperately want to kill it in the garden. Um, <laughs> this is this giant fern. It's, it's not a tree fern, but it gets fronds that are up to 15 feet long. I mean, it's massive. It has a big woody base that, um, the, the Maori used to eat, but it's it's incredible, incredible plant. And there's all kinds of these ferns and filmy ferns and, and relatives. Um, bryophyte, this is a kidney fern, one of the, the filmy ferns that's grown as an epiphyte. Isn't that, isn't that cool? And they're all over the place. Um, I won't go into the, the conifers. I could talk at length about the conifers here. I love the conifers down in this area of the world. Um, but, but just to show you how weird they are compared to other things, this is one they call a celery pine. Um, this, is, this is a conifer, a phyllocladus. We actually have a couple that collected in, in New Zealand back in 2013, growing in our lap, well, in our lap house. I won't say growing in our lap house because <laughs> they are still both about this big uh, after the last um, five or six years growing at the Arboretum. So, not, not growing into the big trees that they do in New Zealand, but they survived, so they got that. So I'm talking a little bit about the gardens. Yeah, this was a garden trip, uh, and New Zealand really is, it's one of those places where they, they seem like they can grow everything there. They can grow everything we can grow, um, and then everything we can't grow as well. In fact, I should have asked some of the gardeners there, what can't you grow? Because it's always interesting to hear what they can't grow. Um, the Auckland Botanic Gardens, I think, is one of the, the great uh, collections in the world. It really is, you know, everything from African plants to New Zealand plants to, um, you know, European plants, North American plants. Um, but they have some great collections where you can go out and look at uh, things side by side, especially the conifers, which I really like. But um, really, 
a little bit of everything there. It, it absolutely drop dead, drop dead gorgeous, and maintained exceptionally well and busy. Um, what I really like on these trips, and one of the benefits of going with a group like the Arboretum, is you get to go into uh, some private gardens that you wouldn't otherwise see if you were going. If you were um, just going and you know reading the guidebooks, they wouldn't tell, send you to Peter Balinese's house up in uh, on the hills in Auckland, which is a, it's a little neighborhood, pretty small lot, probably smaller than my my uh, Raleigh suburban lot up there. Said he has terrible soil, so everything in his front yard he just grows pretty much in containers. Um, but this is it from the road. Uh, it's always fun to drive up to a house like this. I didn't get a picture of it, but right here beside these plants, he has his, his trash bins, you know, his roll out trash bins like we have in Raleigh. Except for on top of it, he had a piece of sod laying over both the trash bins, so they kind of just blended in with everything. <laughs> so I, I, I was like, hey, that's perfect. Um, but he really had this, this incredible garden filled with art, uh, filled with, uh, with plants, um, beautiful things. Every once in a while, I go, hey, we grow that. I mean, it dies back to the ground only gets this big, but hey, we grow that. You know, and we've grown plants in weird ways. Oh, look at that. Isn't that, isn't that cool? And this, I did a double take. I saw this from across. I was like, what is that lotus? That is amazing looking. Well, they're metal. <laughs> they were still cool, but they weren't quite like, you know, I was going to ask for some seed. Uh, but a really cool garden, a neat guy, and he just, you know, we, 35 people wandering around this little tiny garden, his, his backyard kind of went down, he had, um, you know, water features in the back, he had big palms, and he's one of those people that has started planting some trees towards, you know, and his neighbor's property that backed up on there a little bit. And, had a little uh, little bird that rode around and bit people if they got too close. Um, <laughs> cool place. Now, a garden that I was really excited to bring people to. One of this is one of those gardens. It's um, it's a lot like Chanticleer in that it's uh, it's been privately owned and then it's it's really it's a it's a garden for display uh, and and pleasure and a little over the top. In fact, one of the gardeners from um, from Chanticleer, Dan Benarsik had been at Airlies for uh, like a couple of months before, just before we arrived. Um, not to be confused with the North Carolina Airlies Garden. Uh, we went in and it's just this, this lush oasis of, of uh, all kinds of plants. It was a little rainy that day, unfortunately. But you, you just saw these, you know, just everywhere, just jam-packed with plants. And that's, that's what I love to see. People just love plants. But you know, you got hostas growing under tree ferns. Um, it just doesn't seem right. They can grow both of them so well. <laughs> you know, in dryland plants, African plants. It was, it was a really neat place. It took us on a great tour. It would have been nice to have another hour or two there without rain to, to really um, get in there and, and dig around. But just, uh, just amazing garden. And it's one of those gardens that's it's a public garden, but it's only open by appointment. You know, you don't you can't just scroll on through and wander around because the owner, well, the owner, the original owner's daughter is is there for part of the year. Living there. Now, one that we, we back and forth with uh, uh, with the tour guides, they they said there's this great garden that we heard about. They hadn't been there called Paloma, and they had heard about it from, from Dan Hinckley, who you know, usually knows good gardens. And uh, we really were like, do we go there, do we not go there? And we got to this place, and the gentleman shows us around, and he starts off, he says, first he says, I'm going to take you to my garden of death. Like, what on earth? I have no pictures of his garden of death because there wasn't a whole lot in it. Um, there were some poisonous plants. It was brand new, but he had like stacks of little you know, like mortar shells as decorations and, and things like that and skulls around in this wall garden. It was not very pretty. And uh, I'm like, oh God, we wasted a lot of time driving out of our way to get to this place. I loved his fence, you know, but um, my wife told me I couldn't put the picture in there, the, fence, the part of the fence that says you can lead a horticulture, but you can't make her think. <laughs> <laughs> I 
he was not necessarily politically correct. But then, you know, it's one of these things, I've noticed this in gardens and other places. You're walking through and the owner obviously is only marginally interested in walking around with you. And you start talking to them and, you know, you might point out their nice you know, teapots. But you start talking about the plants, you know, and you get really excited about things. And you see something and you ask them about something else. And all of a sudden they realize, oh, hey, this, this group's interested. And then they start getting excited. They're like, oh, well, i got to come over here. i got to show you this. And by the time we left, the, the tour guide was at the bus yelling for us to come. He's like, all right, we'll, we'll go up to the bus, but I want to go this way. <laughs> Circle around, you know. So we got out there. And this is simply one of the best collections of plants I had ever seen in my life. It was, it was amazing. And it's, it's, I think, just one guy and his wife uh, doing this thing. And he had plants from everywhere in the world. Uh, and he had dug this huge pond and built a bridge across the thing. I, you know, this is my problem. I get so, I start getting so enthralled with the garden that I stop taking pictures, so I don't have all the great pictures of it. But um, it was really just one of the absolutely most amazing collections of plants, and it went on for ages. It was kind of down. Part of it was kind of down in a bowl. And like you could see way up along the ridge line, these these trees along the side, and even at part of it, he said, "We won't go down to the arboretum. We don't have time for that." And we were there for for quite a while. And most of the stuff he had done himself. He built, you know, done the concrete work and built these these gazebos. Um, actually, uh, a horticulturist from the University of Tennessee uh, goes there. He said he helped build those steps with him. He comes and does work with him a couple times a year. Uh, which is pretty cool, but these big baconias, these, these big aster, funky aster trees. Great art through the garden, a lot of great um, ceramics there. I can always tell a good garden when I'm excited about plants and my wife, who does not care about plants at all, enjoys the gardens. Um, you know, she did ask me if I could grow about a half dozen things there, which the answer was no every time. <laughs> But really, um, just this just amazing collection. Moving on to another um, garden. And I'm not going to show you every garden we went to. These are just some of the ones that were my favorites. A Hinatahi garden um, was this, this beautiful garden on the South, South Island. Really amazing art all through it. Um, I won't subject you to a bunch of pictures of art, but really beautiful art, beautiful setting. And it was everything from, you know, these very British-looking rose borders and, and um, parterre gardens to wild uh, uh, natural areas. A lot of color, a lot of herbaceous perennials being used here. Um, but really, just meticulously maintained. Love that. But you get out there. Look at this, this piece of art. This is like a 12-foot kind of double disc uh, of steel or aluminum or something suspended between trees. What you can't see is there's a stream down under that. That's actually from the, the stream down below. This is on a slope. That's probably 10 or 15 feet above, above the ground level. And you walk across a bridge and you can see it. It's, it's just art like that all over the place. And you just come upon it. And little places where you could climb up and see the, the gardens. When whoever whoever clips the hedges, they have a full time job. Okay. This was patterned after somebody who went on. We got a bunch of people who went on the trip. Does anybody have patterned after a quilt he his mother made or something like that? Anybody remember? It was patterned after something from his childhood. I know that quilt or, or something. Like Oh God, that's a lot of work. And one of my favorite gardens, just because of the setting, is um, the the Christchurch Botanic Garden. My like Christchurch. The last time I've been there, Christchurch was still kind of in in shambles. They had a bunch of uh, containers, you know, cargo containers. They they were stacked all on the sides of the streets. I was trying to figure out what was going on with those. They had a bad earthquake there not long before I went in uh, 2013. And they had bolted the facades of all these old buildings to the cargo containers. And they were rebuilding the backsides, but the, they were trying to keep the, the facades, these old facades, from falling down. And the whole city was like that. And uh, I was talking with somebody. I was like, oh, this is a, it's kind of neat in this city how they have these little 
these little small parts all over the place here. These, they'd have these little rectangular parts that'd be maybe the size of this room, and, you know, just nice turf there. Like, that was really neat. And they said, well, those were, that's where houses were that, you know, had fallen down in the earthquake. And so there were really just empty lots that they were keeping it mowed down after they removed the houses. So it's kind of neat to go back and see so much that had recovered in that time. But it's a cool city park. It's got a um, this uh, little stream that goes most of the way around it. And they have little people in, you know, all kinds of boating in there. They have paddle boats and they have... Um, you know, punters out there, you can pay a little bit of money and get somebody to take you around on the, the stream there, around the Botanic Garden. So, nice areas to go to. Incredible rock gardens. But one of the really cool things about this place are the trees. This is an old garden, and there are some big trees. And just to give you a perspective, that's a eucalyptus. They had some of the biggest beaches I've seen anywhere in the world. They had, I mean, just all kinds of trees that were just massive, massive trees there. And I'm actually not a big tree guy. You know, I know some people go seek out large trees. I like them when I see them, but that's, but this place is, is really incredible to walk underneath some of these things. Um, beautiful garden. And I don't have a lot of pictures, but there's some great native plant gardens. We went to a private garden that was all done with native plants. It was a really beautiful um, little setting there. Uh, the Otari Wilton Bush uh, in Wellington is another, that's where this was taken. All native plants. Uh, they, they really have a strong focus on native plants uh, there. You know, island nations are really kind of at risk for being overrun with, with uh, you know, exotics. The, the worst one being people, always. <laughs> um, but so they, you know, they, they really do have a have a a love for them. But they use all kinds of all kinds of plants, and they they most places tend to have a pretty um, okay relationship with uh, with exotics and natives coexisting together. Um, but it's such it's great to go to these kind of gardens because when you're walking around, the plants are just so alien. You know, you look at a plant and it's like, what on earth is this? Um, you know, what family is it? They have things in the, the Heath family. I may have a picture with some in the background. So, you know, so same family as rhododendrons and azaleas that look like little spiky bromeliads. They are, I mean, they have no resemblance to anything in the, the Heath family anywhere that I've ever seen. Just absolutely, absolutely bizarre. You know, but really, I think even better than the gardens, the natural areas and the, and the unnatural areas. You know, you drive through and it's about as pastoral as you can get. You know, sometimes back with, uh, uh, you know, beautiful mountains. But there's always a little bit off, you know. It's pastoral and then you have tree ferns growing up in the, the sheep fields, which it just, uh, it doesn't seem right at all. It's just so wrong. Um, you know, and then you have mountains. Uh, some of the some of those beautiful mountains. They call them the Southern Alps on the South Island. There, this ridge along there, um, along there. Um, and they're all over glaciers. They're glaciers that literally come down into subtropic forest uh, rainforest uh, in New Zealand. So you can you can be standing at the beach, um, and I did this. You can stand at the beach and look at mountains and see glaciers, and between the coast where you are and the glacier is. Uh, tropical rain, subtropical rainforest. So, I mean, it's really almost every type of, of uh, environment and, you know, within 80 miles, because you can't be more than 80 miles away from the beach. You know, really just, you know, these grasslands, tussock grasslands. There's like 130 different species of grass in, in New Zealand. Most of them are endemic. They, they only occur in New Zealand. And uh, Mount Taranaki, um, it also, uh, Mount Egmont, I think, let me see, I wrote it down, can't remember the, the English name, uh, Egmont, yeah. So that is, if you see in a movie, Mount Fuji, this is probably what you're actually seeing. Like the last samurai, this is Mount Fuji. <laughs> I have seen, excuse me, I have been near Mount Fuji about a half a dozen times. I have seen it once because it always has clouds in front of it. 
So uh, this is, they filmed this, they filmed there. And some of the mountains, now not this mountain, um, this is about eight or 9,000 feet. The highest mountain is Mount Cook uh, in, um, in the Southern Alps is about 12,500 feet, 12,200 feet, something like that. So the, the highest point east of the Mississippi is Mount Mitchell, 6,000 something feet. So twice as high as Mount Mitchell. You know, these are, these are really high mountains when you get there. And they're 80 miles from, no more than 80 miles from the coast. So it's, they go straight up. Um, Milford Sound, uh, it's beautiful everywhere. Milford Sound is, in 2008, was rated the, by some, some big group, the number one tourist destination in the world, number one tourist spot in the world. Uh, they get about 242 inches of rain a year there. It is the wettest, they say it's the wettest inhabited spot in the world. Full-time inhabited spot. Um, it certainly is in New Zealand. So when it rains, you get all these waterfalls, just just thousands of them. You go out on a boat, and there's just thousands of, of these waterfalls that are going down. A lot of them are, I mean, they'll drop from you know a thousand feet up and never hit the water. They just kind of um, float, you know, evaporate and blow away before they even reach the water. There are only two permanent waterfalls there. All these other thousands of waterfalls only occur when it rains, and they will the majority of them will dry up within three or four hours after it stops raining, and most within a day or two will be completely dry, and you'll just have the two uh, the two permanent ones out there, which is which is just crazy. I mean, you know, it's, it's all these kind of things is hard to catch with a picture, but I mean, all these are waterfalls and they're all coming down. And everywhere you go, it's beautiful, you know, you get these beautiful streams and beautiful lakes with mountains around them. Look at that water, isn't that great? Looks super, like it should be super clear. You can't see through it. It's, it's all, it's mica that's in the water that washes down out of the mountains. So it, um, from that glacial till, glacial dust in there. And it, if the sun's out, it's just screaming blue. If the sun, sun goes away, it's, you know, it, it gets dull again. And, you know, everywhere I went, just wanted to hike through there. And so you, you know, the, the tropical forest as well. Everything, you know, it's nice and wet. Everything's covered in mosses and ferns and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Tussock lands. It really kind of a little bit of everything for anybody uh, to go out there. So they love their birds, especially their kiwis. You know, there are there's only two species of uh, mammals land, that are land-dwelling mammals native to New Zealand. Now they have, you can, you can expand the number of mammals if you count seals uh, and some of the aquatic mammals that are around there, but two species, they're both bats. Mm. There are no, um, you know, no mice and shrews or squirrels or anything like that native to, to New Zealand. And they really like to get rid of most of the ones that are wild in fact, there's, some, there's a possum. It's not our possum. It's, a, it's actually a protected species in Australia that's there. And if you were driving with somebody in New Zealand, and I did this a couple times when I was there before, if you with somebody, they will swerve across multiple lanes of traffic to run over a, a <laughs> possum. If it's there. I'm, I'm serious. And they all will. I mean, that is, that, they must teach that in uh, driver's ed. <laughs> they must try and hit the squirrel. They will go out of their way for it. There's also no snakes in New Zealand. Um, yeah, that's pretty common on a lot of islands that, that not have snakes. But they have a lot of birds, and the birds kind of fill all those other niches. I, actually, I thought this was, this was on the back of our bus, and I thought they were stickers, and this was like the number of kiwi he had run over. I, I asked the bus driver that, and he just looked at me, you know, aghast, the idea of running over kiwis. They love their, their kiwis there. But those, that's just the vents and the, the you know, for the engine in the back of the, the bus. Um, but I'm not a birder. So, you know, and, and I really, I'm, I'm a plant guy. I'm, 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 it's bad. I would like to be more of a naturalist where I'm, I'm noticing more things around me. So, but I'm not. I'm really, I'm so focused on plants. So we're at this garden, and I excitedly told uh, some birders who were here, hey, you got to go to this area. There are so many birds down there. I would, my wife and I were down there, I was like, there are so many birds. And I even, um, let's see if I got it, yeah, taped it. Can you hear that? I'm thinking 
produced like 30 birds. It's one. That was one bird. Oh. <laughs> great, but that's the Parson bird. It was the Tui. I mean, I, I, I really thought there was like a whole flock of different birds in that tree. <laughs> one bird flies out. It's, 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 <laughs> Learn my lesson. Uh, I, think, I think those birders knew that I didn't know what I was talking about <laughs> before they went there. Um, but there are, you know, the moa are not there anymore. They were, there's one of the one of those birds that, that it wasn't Europeans who hunted them to extinction. The, the Maori did that. So in New Zealand, because there are no mammals, the birds took the place of uh, of mammals. So there were, there were uh, about nine species of moa, six different gene, genera of them, and they had the, the, the two biggest ones grew, were about 12 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And they would be out in the open areas and kind of were like, you know, what, you know, cows or uh, giraffes or you know whatever these plain dwelling animals and they would um, go around and eat and then there were smaller ones which were more forest dwelling they were more you know in the four to six foot range and they'd be in the woods eating um, and, and tearing things up there was a, they did have a predator they had a there's a host eagle which is about 30 percent larger than a condor and they would attack even these, these 12 foot tall things and they know that because they found um, talons in the, embedded in the bone of, of these things uh, they found. They went extinct, extinct about um, around 1400 or so and they think they, they went extinct. Um, but the, the plants that have grown up around them kind of adapted to the different type of browsing. So you get these really different plants. You get a lot of what's called uh, plants with devaricating, devaricating growth, where it's branching and twiggy, and it's like this haystack. And there's a lot of plants that do that. And the reason is, if you are an ungulate, you know, if you're a cow or a deer or a giraffe or something like that, if you've ever watched a giraffe eat, you know, they got this long tongue, look, they would be able to kind of wrap it around a whole bunch of that and chomp it, and they would eat this to nothing. Well, a bird with a beak can't do that. They, they have a really hard time eating this or getting much off of it. So the plants here are, are safe from, from, being, from heavy browse. And there are a lot of plants that have this growth. And you know when I said they're more evergreen, they're mostly evergreen plants? This is an evergreen plant. They don't necessarily have a lot of leaves, but it doesn't matter what time of year you go, that's what it looks like. So um, they ever bear, I don't know, evergreen, ever brown. You know, there are a lot of plants that are like that. And you can see like that's a plant with the barricade growth, this is. And some of them, some of them will stay like this their entire life cycle. <coughs> Others, when they get to a certain height, will completely change and they'll grow and you know grow much different. Um, there are other plants with other adaptive features, like the pseudopanix, has these long, kind of saw-edged, uh, really stiff leaves that hang down on the plant when it's young. Just makes a straight stick up, and those things are are pretty vicious, and and birds aren't going to really get in there. But as it gets older. See, there it's going down, there it's starting to go up. Once it gets above moa height, it grows upright and completely changes its habit. And this is that same tree. That's a mature one. And you can see a little one right here that's, that's juvenile. It's the wildest thing. And they know when they get above moa height that they can, they can go up. It's the adaptations are, are really interesting. Um, and, and they're so alien to, to us because the adaptations are based on things that are alien to us, having giant birds running around being the, the, um, the bulk of the, the fauna. Now one of the great things about traveling is you know you get to meet the people and see what they do. This is a Maori village. This is a school where they, they train in some of the um, traditional uh, crafts like carving, they have weaving. Um, and they're really, since, since the 60s and 70s, um, they've really worked to, um, to bring back the, the Maori culture, the, the uh, New Zealand government and, and people are really, really doing a good job. Even though there's only about 3% of the people who can speak Maori, they, they do teach it and uh, are, it's, it's actually growing. Um, so we went to a hangi, which is you know, a traditional uh, barbecue, I guess, uh, for, for the Maori. Uh, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> uh, the, it's 
Okay, I don't know. If any, do we have any uh, you know superhero movie fans? Anybody go see Aquaman? You know, Jason Momoa has has uh, uh, Polynesian descent, and when he went to the the you know, he's the star of he's Aquaman. When he went to the the red carpet opening, he and his children and some of their friends mm -hmm. did a haka um, mm -hmm. in front of the mm -hmm. you know on the red carpet huh. where they did that. And that's uh, kind of a Prelude to war, you know, you kind of scared other people, the other tribe off. Miles <laughs> the women go to the haka, they do a poi. Outside of Queenstown, where they filmed a lot of the Lord of the Rings, so a lot of it was, if you've watched those movies, was very familiar. This is going to be my cover of my, my album when I put it out. <laughs> uh, so, it, are there Lord of the Rings fans? We did not go to Hobbiton when we went. I think, I think there's some people who are upset with me for you didn't go to Hobbiton. But that is Isengard, if you know the movie. And uh, you can see where they get the inspiration for, you know, Fangor Forest and the Ents and things like that. Uh, from from being down there, um, they do. So the the Lord of the Rings movies filming that that brought in about 200 million to New Zealand, which when you have a population of four and a half million, 200 million dollars is a lot of of money. They actually created a minister of Lord of the Rings or something like that, <laughs> the, the, the minister of Middle Earth, uh, seriously to to you know, really make sure they were getting all the dollars they could out of it. Um, and I mean, they, they remind you, when you fly into the airports, they, this is, that's in the Auckland airport, <coughs> that one's in, I think in Wellington, Wellington. or Christchurch, Smog and one of them as well, I can't remember, maybe Wellington. Um, you know, everywhere you go, they've, they've got uh, some Lord of the Rings stuff there. So really, you know, you get great guards, you get great nature, you get great, you know, Get to meet great people, see great things, but really the best part for me anyway is oh. getting to travel with uh, friends from the Arboretum, old friends, new friends, um, get to know people a lot better yes. on those trips. It's, it's really a lot of fun. Um, and we've been doing these trips in this kind of iteration for you know, four or five years now, and it's really, you know, I've got some great friends out of, out of doing these trips, so it's been fantastic. So I'll end with a, a plug. I started with a plug for our Southeastern Plant Symposium. I'll end with a plug. We do have another trip coming up in January again. So January 18th through the 29th. See, I like, I like going to Southern Hemisphere in the middle of January. It's a good time to go away. Um, we're going to Galapagos Islands and uh, the, the Amazon. It's, called Am it's not really the Amazon because we're on the... Pacific side of Ecuador where we're going, but the rainforest. Um, not so many gardens this time, but some, some natural areas. 
uh, this is where we'll stay in the rainforest. We're not going to be you know, not going to be roughing it. Uh, but Quito, uh, which is which is really just a beautiful, beautiful city, it's called City of Eternal Spring. Um, it's right there near the equator. Um, we'll go to the rainforest day here. Then we'll go to the Galapagos Islands for five nights. And in the Galapagos, rather than be on a boat the whole time, which is how it's often seen, we'll actually stay at a resort on one of the islands and go out each day on the boat. So if anybody decides that they don't want to go see uh, more uh, cacti and, and Galapagos tortoises and finches, uh, they can stay and drink fruity drinks by the pool while we all have <laughs> um, It's going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, be, I know there's a few people in this audience who are already signed up to go. We've got we're about a little over half full right now, maybe three quarters full. So we've got a few more spots left. So I'm happy to answer questions about Ecuador. Um, Happy to talk. I mean, excuse me about New Zealand. <laughs> We're actually not talking about either one. Shoot, shoot. Any of your geography questions? I'll take them all now. <laughs> I didn't see any sheep. You didn't see any sheep. You know, I was looking for a picture. I had a picture from actually from 2013 of a shot, and it was these green pastures with sheep in it, and there was a a gorse. Um, that was used as a fence all along there. And there was a rabbit that went through. And I took the, and when I was looking at the pictures back in 2013, I realized that there was not a single native thing in that picture. <laughs> the rabbits weren't native, the sheep weren't native, the grass wasn't native, the gorse wasn't native. Um, but no, I didn't, I didn't take a whole lot of pictures of sheep. That's, I, I grew up in South Central Virginia. We had sheep where I, uh, in Prince George County. And I didn't take pictures of those. <coughs> sheep is good to eat, though. Any questions, thoughts? Did I miss anything from the people who went on the trip? You missed a lot, right? It's a strange question, but we've been to Ireland and everywhere we looked at the sheep, but they all had dots on them, red, green, blue, yellow, orange. How do they mark the same way down there? Just your um, they do. A lot of them are marked, but not all of them. And I don't know what... I, I remember somebody telling me what it was, but I don't remember. It, it wasn't... What farm they belong to. What farm they belong to? Brand brand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they can wander wherever they are, and people know who they belong to. Right. That is now. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. They also have a lot of deer farms there. A lot of deer. Yeah, they they farm them just you know, just like dairy they cattle and ours. sheep. Yeah, we'll <laughs> they, they, there's about three or four different species that they that they do there, and you know they're all from different areas. And man, you can get a lot of venison at uh, at in restaurants there. One of the best things I ever ate was, my first trip there was Deer Dunedin. It was like Beef Wellington, except for it was this slab of venison like that. It was delicious. I talked about it so much my last birthday, my daughter made me a Deer Dunedin inspired uh, meat pie. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing better than meat pie. Meat and, and pastry. But not the same. It was not the same. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I think she knew. <laughs> it was a thought that counts. It was a thought that counts. Yeah, That's a right. very nice thought. All right, yeah. Is the South Island below the Arctic Circle? The Antarctic Circle? No, none of, it, none of it's below uh, the Antarctic Circle. Now it is, it, Wellington is the, well, actually Wellington is the south side of the North Island. That is the, the farthest south national capital. And if you go down towards the south, you get down towards the Southlands, you you start getting to a lot of places, which is the, the southernmost this, the southernmost this, the southernmost this. Um, yeah, as you get down there, but you're still you're still a little ways away from the Arctic Circle. So then, most of the agricultural products are found in the North Island. But the South Island is probably has more agriculture than the North Island. You know the way the um, the uh, ocean currents are around there, it stays. Along the coast, it's pretty warm. You get up in the mountains, and you get you, it's alpine. But even pretty far south, um, it's still um, it's still pretty warm down there. Did you go in any of the caves with the glowworms? I did. We did not do any of the caves with glowworms. Didn't have time for that. But there are these these caves caves both on the North and South Island where it's a it's actually a little um, it's basically like a fruit fly kind of thing net that. Uh, first cousin to a mosquito, that their larvae 
are down there. And apparently, so the, the, the luminescence, the light there is, has something to do with the silt that they produce, but it's brighter the more hungry they are, I am told. I've never seen it, never been there. But there's one I would have liked to have gone to if we had had time on the South Island where you actually you take a boat and go through the caves through it. Um, I would have loved to have done that. I still, right now, in my head, the glow worms, you know, are like, you know, blue LED lights. It's so bright. So as long as I never go, I'll always think that. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Mark.